my name is uh, Simon Ings. Um, I'm, in there. Um, I'm the uh, culture editor at New Scientist, and it's a huge privilege for me to be invited along to um, talk uh, about the um, creative industries and sustainability. Um, uh, a panel discussion um, that which I think will explore some of the more difficult questions and some of the more f formal problems and ungetaroundable get aroundable <laughs> difficulties uh, that this industry uh, traditionally has to cope with and will we'll have to cope with in the future. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, Naresh Ramchandani, a partner at Pentagram and a creative director and co-founder of the environmental charity Do the Green Thing, uh, and also runner of a competition in 2014 that brought us a strawberry in a parka, which is one of my favorite images oh of that, that on that uh, <laughs> website. Um, Fiona Morgan is uh, in the middle here, is head of uh, Bigger Picture and the Sky Ocean Rescue Campaign. Um, she knows more about cycling than is entirely healthy uh, <laughs> and, <Not> has <laughs> and has gone on to um, save a large proportion. How many <laughs> square kilometers of the oceans is, is lots. now? Lots. lots. Yeah. Lots. Tens of more thousands of square. More to go. More to go. <laughs> and uh, Paloma Strelitz is the uh, co-founder of uh, Assemble which uh, won the Turner in 2014? 15. 15, sorry, 2015, yes. 2015 for uh, a housing regeneration project um, coming from the culture pages of New Scientist. This, this speaks to me a lot, this difference between uh, technology and community and art and the categories that we make around them in order to hold discussions, but which can also get in the way of in innovative work and mm. innovative ideas. So, um, so, here is our panel, and, and thank you for coming. And I guess I wanted to um, start with, um, it, it seems to make sense to start with you, Paloma. Um, this question of um, a, brand a, a, a brand identity, a product, a package, and a community. And it seems that so much of the work that I was looking at in the panel that I've just been on, the uh, judging panel, uh, so much of the work that's being done here is to try and find new ways of addressing a community, not in a, some sort of top-down way, but in a way that engages the community's own creativity and engagement and ethical investment in, in, um, in what's being proposed mm. or what's being suggested. So I just wondered if you could tell me something about how, how Assemble fits into this, you know, potentially quite corporate environment. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's it's really great to be here today. And I think what's interesting to be speaking alongside Naresh and Fiona is that this is obviously, uh, it's kind of indicative of the fact that this is such an enormously broad field and that there are so many different levels on uh, which you can sort of intersect uh, with it. Um, and so uh, I think in the context of the pro work that we did in Liverpool in Granby, which was kind of working alongside the Granby uh, Four Streets Community Land Trust um, was to kind of present a vision of the, a positive vision of their community back to the council um, to say stop demolishing homes in this context, let's start preserving, rebuilding and um, uh, growing this community again. And I think that, um, and uh, if you like the kind of the symbol of of greenery and of growing and of uh, physical uh, sorry visible care in our physical surroundings was actually very emblematic of that of that project and so I think one of the things that sort of uh, brings to my mind about how you know maybe some one of the things that we can t talk about today is is kind of two ways of uh, having a conversation about this topic one of which which is about uh, the future uh, future potential uh, new products, new ways of addressing things, um, new technologies. But I suppose the other side of that conversation seems really importantly to be about how do we um, how do we care for what we have? How do we see value in uh, kind of things which have already been built, um, things which are already out there in the world, already constructed? Um, uh, and how do we kind of reinvest back into those things and perhaps you know perhaps that requires us to shift our perception a little so perhaps it's about like you know uh 
less demolition and more uh, kind of reconfiguration or, re or uh, more about reusing the resources that we've already deployed and have available to us. So I'm kind of, that's something that I'm perhaps interested in talking about uh, today. Uh, there is a project that I, I came across on your website, which was the Seven Sisters Underground Station. Mm. And it was looking at the way in which one of those resources is the fact that you can get communities to talk with each other, that you can get communities to, to produce material and build communities around action. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think actually, again, it's probably more, um, uh, probably more so the case in the Liverpool project, right. um, where we've been uh, sort of working very actively in the, in the neighbourhood of Granby, and, and part of the elements of looking at kind of... Uh, looking at the kind of development of the around this these sorts of sets of streets is looking at not just the kind of how do you rebuild houses but how do you uh uh rebuild uh kind of moments for collective cultural life and yeah. for creative collective creative action and i think one of the things which was uh, sorry it's, it's a sort of a long it's too long a story to say in this context but um what had was kind of really interesting about this place where we were working in granby is that this uh neighborhood had a very long history of create collective creative action so they um after kind of years of government and council neglect they really kind of galvanized to take over their streets to to sort of tidy them up to start planting in the streets to start hosting i suppose collective events to bring people to the neighborhood and i think maybe one of the things that that speaks to is um like the the possibility of um what happens, oh, oh, I suppose that the fact that kind of change never happens at one level, but also, mm. but always at multiple levels. It happens at your doorstep and it happens in the street and it happens in an event you might do once a year or, you know, um, and, and, and so there's so many levels onto which we kind of need to start looking at kind of the cultures around sustainability and sustainable growth and, uh, and say that this isn't a kind of one strand of conversation, but we need to be kind of addressing it at every level from, you know, from the scale of the front door to the scale of the city or the ocean. Fiona, working in what is potentially a, a one-to-many media environment, how do you engage, how do you create or engage a community starting from the point of view of of, of sitting there in a, a one-to-many environment, so you're you're you're, say you're giving one message to many people. I think Sky. You d we want to talk about Sky Ocean Rescue. Yeah. Um, I think Sky Ocean Rescue has been so successful because we've had news channels behind it. Sky News has been the figurehead of the campaign, and what we're good at is broadcast. So we knew we could get eight million people every morning on sunrise, um, and I think that's where we started. I think you know we launched the campaign very quickly. It's become a very cluttered market, which is great because we're all here to save the ocean from drowning in plastic. We're not here to compete against each media company. Um, and I think, yeah, we went traditional broadcast. So let's do news documentaries. Let's do content. Let's take over the EPG, the homepage. Let's do you know, social media. Let's do some stuff in sport because Sky obviously is synonymous with sport. But now we're looking at actually as a broadcaster, what else can we do? Be a bit more creative. And I don't think we've done it yet. It'd be interesting right. to hear questions about Sky Ocean Rescue. But as a campaign, it's been quite corporate. I think now we're going to change it to it's been a big awareness broadcast campaign. Now it's how do we drive action in the community? And in not only about money and talking to people, it's about how do we actually do that tangibly and get people to help you know, through our reach. We're in 100 million households. So there must be a way that Sky can connect that you know, to behavior change. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. Yeah. And uh, I suppose the, the, the campaign Ocean Plastics appears, at least on the surface, to be um, a winnable good. You, you're not, um, no one particularly has much invested in processes that couldn't be transformed yeah. To, to, to one's economic benefit. There's yeah. not a huge amount of money to be made in generating things that, mm, that generating plastics then stick around for yeah. a thousand years. Yeah. With subjects like um, climate change, however, that is, that is such a broad, uh, to take an example that I want to explore with, uh, with you, Naresh, uh, with an example like climate change, you have the problem that th there's, there's so much invested in so many different kinds of infrastructures in the world as it is, 
yeah. that it's relatively easy to either foster unconsciously yeah. or in fact deliberately manufacture doubt. And at that point, you have to ask how does one engage with people and at what kind of, what kind of form of address will get response from people who are doubtful, <laughs> who just don't know the problem and have probably been told that, you know, have, have been given uh, a, news uh, a news feed which gives them contrary information, uh, contradictory information. To, to what extent is what you do nudging? Or is that a word that fills you with terror and... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it, it's, I think we, um, we, do, we do do some nudging and then we do do some shoving. We do both of them. <laughs> I would say. Um, I mean, we um, w w the the start point uh, we start from is that um, most people understand that the world's going to pot and something needs to be done, and most people understand that um, it needs to happen not just at um, uh, an international level or a na national level, but also at an individual level. Right? I think that's understood. Um, but then uh, it's difficult to know what to do. I think when um, there are every day you're uh, confronted by um, lots of options and choices of messaging that uh, it makes it very, very tempting to be unsustainable. And um, so where we start from is that actually, given that it's tough to be sustainable in your everyday lives, we have to basically shove at some point to say um, those uh, institutions or corporations or, tr or traditions that are making it difficult, we're going to take them on, we're going to point them out and say the absurdity of the problems that are put in every single person's way every single day. That's the shoving part. So we will take issue with, for example, um, just out this week, last week, last week is our issue about weddings, looking at the idea of weddings and how they're basically turning into consumption splurges. Uh, and just pointing that out to people and then giving, and then the nudges are by giving, by nudging people towards ways around it. That's the, so that's the shove and that's the nudge part. Um, yeah. So we're happy to take on industries or traditions like the makeup industry we took on a couple of years ago, or even, um, I'm not sure if you can call it an industry, you probably can, the cocaine industry, uh, which we took on last year and pointed out that cocaine actually has an enormous carbon effect. Um, and um, it's to ask people to then sort of find different routes around that. Um, but we shove first by taking issue and then we nudge by inspiring people to action. I think it needs both. So I wanted to ask all three of you what your relationship was to information, knowledge, evidence, mm -hmm. fact. Uh, because I come from new scientists, I come from a sort of museum background. And what has happened over the years within the museum and gallery environment is that we've more or less begun to abandon the deficit model of public engagement in which we assume that people are ignorant of something that we have they will come along and we will then pour the, pour the information into the empty bucket and they will go away informed. And what that actually usually ends up as is that if you provide people with information, w they will take on that information and use it to bolster whatever view they started with. For the simple reason that information takes time to process. So the moment you're deluged with something, your immediate response, whoever you are, whatever your background, your immediate response is defensive. Ah, right, okay, but what do I think? as I'm being deluged with this new information. You know, oh, I think this. And so, with, certainly with climate change, you've had a real problem with uh, people being given facts and that actually not making any difference at all. And it's not because they're terrible people, it's because they're people, and that's the way people operate in the world. So, um, if I can start with you again, Naresh, I mean, what is your relationship to the data and how you, I mean, is, is, is raw data ever useful to you? Yeah, it, I think it's super useful. I mean, the, yeah. the, the data is, um, First of all, the data is proof that there's a problem, right? So the data are on um, in how many years the sea level is going to rise by how many centimeters uh, because of global temperatures rising by how many degrees and how many species will be extinct or how many square kilometers of land will be underwater, therefore how many people will have to become climate migrants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That really helps to paint a credible picture of the problem or um, uh, an undeniable picture of the problem, then I think you have to put it into human terms. I don't think yeah. the data does it enough, mm -hmm. um, personally, or at least it, maybe that works for some people, but that wouldn't work only for me. I think I then need to know the effect on lives, um, and then 
as well as um, a story of catastrophe, I think I need something hopeful to galvani galvanize me into action. So then I need to know um, the positive things that can be done and how actually they may even enrich my life rather than actually detract from it. So that's the journey I need to go on. But I think it needs to start from uh, science because otherwise I feel people, um, you know, uh, consumption, which is what we're effectively always waging war against, is a habit. Uh, you know, it's, it's a habit stroke addiction, and I think people like to hold on to their habits or addictions, and they look for reasons to stay with them. And if you, for example, have a piece of, um, if you have a stat, if, if you don't have credibility, then you, can so, then you can say, oh, that's just rhetoric, you would say that, you know, show me the proof. Or if worse, you actually quote a piece of data and it's not true, you know, you've got the, you've got the data wrong, then your argument is down. So I think you have to, I think it, it offers proof and also um, you know, enforces credibility. I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Um, Fiona, given that the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the Oceans project began within the news cycle, oh. then it's, it's um, would I be right in thinking that it's a relatively uncontested and s simple relationship between your work and, and fact? Yeah, definitely. I think being a media company to be credible and Sky Ocean Rescue campaign, everything we do or talk about or anyone we work with we need to make sure they're credible and the data is we have a whole business transformation team that audit every piece of data on Sky Ocean Rescue. And we right. don't, even if we hear it from other sources until Sky News or our, we call them the Ocean Ninjas, well that's my name for them, trying <laughs> to make them a bit more fun, um, than sustainability managers, although that's still very fun. Um, they would check them to make sure that at sky level, because if we go out, people you know, are skeptical of, of, of what we say in some ways and think it's like ocean rescue is not directly related to our business. So we need to make sure that it is unbelievably credible and something we've done kind of on data and insight about consumer behavior, I think is you need the data, but how you tell it is critical. And I don't think people in the sustainability or CSR world have done it consumer friendly enough to date. So that's part of our sky ocean rescue is instead of saying our ocean is going to drown in plastic, you know, there's going to be no fish left by 2050, which actually all our research across Europe makes people go, oh my God, that's too hard to fix. I'm not, I don't want to be involved. Mm -hmm. Let's visually represent the problem. Let's make it kind of digestible for them, make it relevant to their life. And I think, especially in ocean health, we've just been a bit too like, this is, it's awful, you know, but just make it a bit more, I think, be creative in the way that you talk about data and make it, you know, communicate it. I think that's something that I feel strongly about we're going to try and do more of. Yeah, definitely. Paloma, uh, in terms of uh, data, I just wondered to what extent you have to bring data to bear and knowledge to bear and numbers to bear as you look for, um, to demonstrate the social effect of what you do. Um, I just wondered to what extent you can uh, run on a sort of an anecdotal model of explaining yeah. the transformations that you've created, or to what extent there's someone <laughs> sitting in an office somewhere saying, give mm -hmm. me the figures on that, and you know, how, how can you possibly metricize what you do? I think it's a real challenge. I mean, I'm aware that uh, I, you know, the scale of our projects is kind of, if you like, physically quite small, but I, I work within the world of architecture and urbanism, and that is an enormous industry, and the building and construction industry is very wasteful and, v and very unsustainable and actually hasn't moved forwards very much. So, you know, sort of to give an, e and, and so I think to give an example perhaps a that is a little bit reflective of the attitude, because I think, you know, everyone, I think it everyone kind of, I think, want, you know, in this context, wants to be more sustainable, but sometimes it's kind of the actions that, uh, and the culture around us that can make it quite hard. So I have another role, aside from Assemble, which is that I'm a, um, a uh, mayoral design advocate. So I sort of sit with a group of other people from the built environment discipline um, in this uh, group who are supposed to sort of uh, feed back to the GLA um, ideas for good growth in London. And that good growth is is many things. And of those, one, one um, pillar, if you like, is, is uh, the circular economy. And so we had a sort of a big uh, group discussion yesterday um, a big session, and we all had to sort of split up into different groups, self-selecting groups about the kind of uh, the policy that we wanted to discuss. And um, 
and I was in one of the most popular ones, which was sort of industrial intensification, but we were right next to the circular economy table, which was less than half the size of any of the others. And it simply wasn't the interest group that people were drawn to um, you know, from the broader sector. And it was pointed out by the person leading the group how disappointing that was. And that's true, it's really disappointing. Um, and so we were talking about language then yesterday. Why, what is it about the way that that language around the circular economy is phrased um, perhaps that makes made it so unappealing, despite the fact that it is so vital to all of us. And then we were talking, mm. partly because Naresh is a writer, <laughs> just before we came out on stage about about the language around sustainability and and you know what is it that is are perhaps um, barriers to making it something that feels a bit more inclusive and a bit more accessible. And so I thought maybe that's you know an interesting thing for us to to hear your thoughts on and to sort of to think a bit about. Yeah. Sure. Do you want some thoughts? Um, oh, you it can seems ask like an appropriate moment, uh, yeah. I would say, <laughs> yes. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we feel that with um, sustainability, I mean, this is a very interesting conversation because we're having uh, a very serious conversation, right? This is a pretty serious conversation, I would say. Very serious. Uh, and uh, sustainability is a very serious issue and the things that are happening to the world are very serious. But I also think, um, I suppose we start from the standpoint that we have to make action desirable enough for people to want to do it, uh, and that action needs to wear the right clothes, not just the strawberry wearing the anor anorak, although that's mm -hmm. a perfect symbol of that. <laughs> um, and those, those clothes have to be creative. I mean, we're all creative people here. Um, I, I imagine most of us are creative people here, and what that makes us uh, uniquely qualified to do is actually uh, to take products or services or ideas and make them desirable. We're very good at um, saying this thing has this much magic or value to it to make it attractive. And we have to do that with, with, with sustainable action, with everyday action. We have to do that. And so I think that means giving it um, as compelling uh, a set of uh, visual or verbal clothes um, as the problem, which is unsustainable action, you know, which is defined by all the marketing we see uh, around us every day. I mean, this, the, the advocacy for sustainable um, behavior has to be as compelling as the advocacy for the opposite. It has to be as desirable, in other words. And that includes things that maybe don't at first feel um, intuitive around the climate change space, including uh, imagination or lightness or humor or subversiveness or um, everyday memes, everyday words. You know, it involves actually just daring to perhaps step out of, dare I say, the scientific space yeah. um, or the um, argumentative space or the space of moral obligation and actually make it an attractive and interesting and desirable choice. So that's the way we go at uh, climate change communication. That doesn't mean it's the only way to do it, far from it but um, we started to do the green thing with the observation that perhaps that space is, m something's not happening in that space and that we could try it. Uh, and that was our thesis that we went on to, I wouldn't say prove because um, climate, it, it, we, don't, we don't succeed until climate change is stopped, which of course is uh, extremely difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think the fact that it has its own momentum and we have a voice and that voice contributes to a conversation I think is some form of, if not success, not failure. Uh, and I think, therefore, some worth. Um, as far as I understand it, this is the first such panel that uh, DNAD has uh, run. It's been put together by um, a group um, organised by uh, Emmeline Skelton at DNAD to look at the uh, whether the creative industries can solve uh, <laughs> what, in linguistic terms at any rate, is a formal and insoluble problem which is how you can have sustainable growth. As a friend of mine once said, you know, how can you have a robust cancer? Um, growth itself in a finite environment is not going, you know, generally speaking, does not end well. <laughs> so um, I suppose, Fiona, in, in particular, you're, you're at the, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> the bowsprit of the ship as it heads towards oh. the iceberg here, right. in that you're working in an industry that is, um, um, has traditionally, uh, in inevitably and traditionally, represented um, the status quo is perhaps putting it too strongly, but uh, has, has presented a model of commerce that is about using new resources 
that, the, that is tied to create, tied to discovery yeah. rather than reinvention is I think what I'm, 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 I'm trying to get to. Finding new resources, finding new markets rather than reinventing or, or reshaping. Is that, is that fair or am I being incredibly... Um, un, un, um uh, what do you mean by that as guys of business in general? TV. TV, media TV industry. Advertising, advertising and the consumerism that is driven yeah. by, la well, yeah, by visual yeah, advertising quite a lot. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, we kind of touched on it. I'm kind of answering your question here, but within Sky, um, obviously we have Sky Media, which is uh, a company that sells obviously online advertising and things like Sky and Rescue has brought a consciousness to our discussions with people like Sky Media because as a broadcaster, like you said, I, I actually think Sky do reinvent themselves out of the industry. I think out of anyone, we are quite we do reinvent and right. that, that's something I think we do. We're always reinventing, rebranding. You know, if people, agencies work with us, they'll know that. Um, but, but what we do in Sky Media is we have this media, it's a revenue generating business, a billion pounds a year. Um, and it's all, you know, it's on Sky platforms and other platforms. And you have a decision when, say they had a client who's a huge single use plastic brand that wants to do a huge multi-million pound advertising campaign on, on Sky shows, what do you do? And Sky have said, Sky Ocean Rescue is a campaign we believe in. It's the heart of our business. It's our brand. This is why we see the bigger picture. We're doing it. And you know, these are decisions we're going to have to make, which I think is quite challenging. And I don't think other media industry, other media companies would do that, but we are. You know, we actually, we're, we're committed to this. This is you know, not just kind of a PR stunt. Yeah. And um, uh, Paloma, over, uh, over to you. <laughs> yeah, well, to, to the extent that um, you are in the reinvention or the the the, 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 the reinvention business, if mm, you like, mm. um, has there ever been a moment where you felt the need to scale, or is scalability not not part of your? It's interesting. I mean, uh, again, this was another f a fleeting conversation we were having backstage uh, about the difference between scale and impact. But <laughs> I think that one thing that's kind of, um, you know, I, I sort of rarely sit next to uh, people who sort of are, are from, you know, uh, television channels, which perhaps should happen more. But I think what it sort of makes me think about a lot is the power of, of media, really, to share stories and narratives. And the fact that I'm very aware of, if you like, the small physical scale of many of our projects, even though I hope that in their context they're quite impactful. But I think that one thing that has really propelled our work and our themes and our interests has the, been the ability of uh, kind of uh, magazines and of TV and of different forms of media to tell the story. And so the story, which might be quite small and quite local and a quite, you know, uh, a, a local but transformative moment, has the ability to actually have a much bigger impact through storytelling. And actually, I think that seems like a pretty, a pretty sustainable way to tell a story. <laughs> you can do some small actions. You can talk about modes of behavior. You can focus on... Uh, intimate moments of transformation, but then the ability to kind of broadcast that, to tell that story to a much broader audience seems actually um, really important because obviously what we're talking about in terms of changing behaviors is changing behaviors across the spectrum from the scale again of, 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 you know, of individuals, what I do with my mm. you know, packaging or my plastic bags to the scale of policy. And we need to be kind of moving through those narratives all the time across the different scales. Well, this is, this is what I wanted to ask is perhaps uh, what is tragically <laughs> going to be probably our last question or our second to last question at any rate, because we're going to have to finish at half past, I'm afraid. And that is to what extent the creative industries, as you each define them in, in radically different ways, <laughs> presumably, to what extent the creative industries can not simply address their, their publics and their audiences, but actually change policy for their clients and their sponsors and their you know, they're betters, if you like, just to pl pluck a word out of the air that will apply to all three of you in, in, your, in your different areas. Um, Fiona? So you mean that by how are we transforming our business? How, how are we using our how influence you and voice? How you speak to the board? You know, yeah. do the creative industries, can, can, crea can creative messaging change policy at the highest level? Yeah, of course it can. Yeah. And it should, I think, because yeah. it's got the scale. Yeah. to do that and I think that's how it will be because consumers will understand it if it's more creative and more you know digestible yeah but I think um what you're saying is is doing at every level I think you know 
at Sky, but you've got to look within. I think we're using our influence to change all of our suppliers, all of our partners. Tomorrow we've got a huge announcement that we're going to make around a big partner that we're going to change their behavior and try and uh, go after a sport to change its behavior in single-use plastic. So, you know, we are doing everything we can. Every agency that works with us, from brand agencies to, you know, you name it, again, we'll only take them on board if they change their, if they have a certain sustainability, their contracts have new sustainability terms and conditions. I mean, that's, again, people don't want to come on board, you know, you're having that discussion, and that's kind of now part of what we do in our everyday life. We've got to change our business. I think one thing what frustrates me in, in this world, and again, I'm quite new to it because I come from a brand, um, background, not a, I'm not as intelligent as the other people on here, but more of a brand and, and I suppose creative look at it is, um, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> what was I saying there? <laughs> what was I saying? But it must have been good, whatever it I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> You're talking about partnership deals. Oh, change your own business. So a lot of people talk a good talk PR and do great brand campaigns, huge big brand campaigns. You know, it's like, this is who we stand for. This is what we've done. And you've seen recently, a lot of uh, social media companies have done that. And then look what actually they do stand for. So I think what we've been true to ourselves is we've got a head of, we've got a responsible business team who we call inspiring business. Again, trying to make it, you know, more aspirational, you know, not so, it's not dull. It's amazing what they do. Um, and we are changing what we do as a business. We won't have single-use plastic in our packaging. We don't do X, Y, and Z. And I think a lot of people talk a good game, but do they walk it? They talk a good brand purpose, but actually you've got to live it and do it and invest in it, mm -hmm. which I think, I mean, I don't know what you think about brands. Be interesting. Right. What do you think about people? Do they live it? That um, people that shout out about a lot? Uh, I think people, the more people who know about it, the more people will live it. I mean, that's what, I think that's what, I mean, our, f our forward um, manifesto is creativity versus climate change. Right, and uh, I, I think creativity has many roles to play, but I think two primary ones is having the creativity to imagine uh, different different solutions to consumption, so different products or services or business models or ways or hacks on our culture, and then having the creativity to present that to enough people in a sharp enough way. I think I think all behaviour change has some great creativity at the spearhead of it, helping it to be uh, understandable and digestible, sometimes catchy, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, five a day, yeah. Me Too, etc. I mean, these are all brilliant bits of creativity that are sitting behind great behaviour, you know, that are helping to sharpen fantastic pieces of activity and action, which are in, th which are in, th in themselves great pieces of creativity. So I think creativity is super important actually, and, and there's many different types of it that have a role to play. Can I mention one thing? Because downstairs we have, I, I do think new technology as well, we're finding there's a big piece of research on behavior change and how VR and AR have a huge role to play in that. They actually have bigger results on behavior change than anything else, and that's something we're looking at, about how for young people, how do you bring that into schools, or how do you do that with young people? And I think that's another way creativity is looking at different ways of just doing yeah. big marketing campaigns that. around this. That's tremendous. I was just about to ask about the role of playfulness in your in your work, <laughs> each of you, and that's a fantastic I example. Um, but um, is uh, to what extent is playfulness uh, a useful way into public engagement? I mean, I think playfulness is really central to lots of our work, and so is an idea of kind of how can we all be more. Um, the fact that you know we we all live in urban environments, and yet it feels like we have very little agency within this space that frames our everyday lives. And so, something that Assemble is very interested in is is how we can, in a way, be more active participants. Um, I think Fiona's previous point about young people is really interesting because you know one thing that I'm kind of increasingly aware of in my behaviour is is the way, if you like, that um, I think both at a personal level and at a kind of a uh, societal level, um, habits become culture. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting to see is kind of uh, looking at uh, younger people and children and how and how in a way they haven't don't have the same bad habits. Um, or that perhaps that there's been there's a kind of a changing uh, narrative and culture around some of those habits, and I think there's an enormous opportunity there to start seeing, uh, you know, uh, good habits um, probably at an early age grow into sort of a better culture around ideas of sustainability. And you know, I'm I'm kind of really hopeful that we might see a kind of 
equivalent moment. I mean, you could sort of see, you see what's happened sort of since the Parkland shooting in, in the US with, with young people and how, in a way, uh, literate they are around um, ideas of mass communication um, and digital media and to sort of see an equivalent moment perhaps with young people around uh, ideas of sustainability because I think that is very plausible and I, I don't think there has been a big public moment of that, certainly in the UK um, in sort of recent years and I think that would be really exciting and I'm kind of waiting for it to happen. Uh, Naresh, quickly if you could, do you feel that that moment is upon us? Yeah. Uh, sorry, is this the playful question? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, a play, a that's playfulness. the answer I was thinking. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, no, I was thinking of a, 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 a moment around of, of engagement around playfulness to do with climate yeah. change because it is yeah. a subject that bogs I down. Think it, I think it needs it. I think it needs, it needs to be, I think we need to be um, incredibly confrontational because our, our culture is pointing in the wrong direction that, you know, of consumption and unsustainable growth, as you say. So we need yeah. to be really confrontational against the forces uh, that are propelling it that way. And that means being very daring. That means calling out brands, figureheads, anyone who's doing the wrong... You know, we are blissfully unsponsored, uh, and we are r we're cr that leaves us crazily clear to basically slag off anyone we want to. <laughs> but then you, have to be, you then have to make it palatable. You have to make it uh, charming and engaging and sometimes playful to actually uh, allow people to um, connect with it. Um, so you need to take people on and make the connections. So I think there is a space for playfulness, but not by itself. And provide solutions, though. I do yeah. think, like, yeah. well, Sky, I would love to name and shame brands on uh, Sky News and Single Use Plastic, <laughs> but I'm not allowed. <laughs> Um, maybe one day you'll see me. Um, <coughs> but I do think providing solutions, again, is you know saying you, you really need to give them top tips and solutions and creative ways of looking at problems. I mean, we're setting up an innovation fund, but you need to invest in that too. Yeah. I think that's quite important, sustainability, I would say. Yeah. Well, this conversation has left me energised. I hope it's left you energised. Thank you so much to Fiona, Paloma and Naresh. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm Simon. Thank you very much indeed.